Good morning, everyone. So my paper's title is uh, Novel Technique for Proof, Texture, and Information Content for Approved Medical Images. So first of all, big thanks for me and my advisor, Dr. Salari, to the conference organizer to give us the opportunity to present our paper here. So the outlines of my presentation are going to be First, I'm going to talk about the background of image diffusion in general. Then I'll go over the proposed <coughs> method and the tools we use for fusion. Then I'll show you the results with the conclusion. So the need for image diffusion and image processing techniques is mainly increasing due to the increased number and variety of image acquisition tasks. Uh, image diffusion is defined as the process of combining the substational information you from different sensors using mathematical techniques in order to create a single composite image that will, that will be more comprehensive for a human operator and other computer vision tasks. And current technology in imaging offers a wide variety of information that can be extracted from an observed scene. Images which have been acquired using different sensor modalities offer exhibit diverse characteristics, such as type of degradation, salient features, and texture properties. So the fusion may be accomplished at three different levels. So the first one is the pixel level fusion. It's performed on a pixel by pixel basis. And the, the fused output <coughs> image is combined from the pixels of each source image. And then after you have your fusion image, you apply your evaluation method, and then after that, you get your result. At the feature level based, first it requires a feature extraction. And after that, these similar features of the, of the two sources images are fused to get the, the output image. And the, the, the decision level is the more advanced level it requires a feature extraction first, then the identification of these features. After that, you apply your evaluation to get to decide which which result is good. So we have four different types of fusion. First one is the multifocus fusion, which is two images with different focal lengths. The second one is the multispectral fusion, with two images taken with different spectral bands. And the third one is the multi-sensor fusion, of two images taken from different sensors. And the fourth one, which is the center of this research, is the multimodality fusion, of two images taken from two different modality sensors. So the first one is the multi-focus multi images. And we, ha we have here, for example, five source images. And by fusing all of them, we will be able to get a single image that, ha that is clear in all direction of the image compared with the source images. And this is another example of the multispectral fusion images. So the, here we have like a panchromatic image, gray image with a high resolution and on the right side, it's a multi-spectral with like RGB color image, but with a low resolution images. So by fusing them together, we will be able to get a single image that is a high resolution and has the, the, the RGB colors from the second image. So here, this is the source image, high resolution gray image, and the second one is the RGB color, but with a low resolution image. So by fusing, them, by fusing them together, we will be able to get a better image than these two together. This is another example of the two images taken from two multiple sensors. So this is an example of the multimodality fusion. So the first one is the CT, which shows the bone information and the MRI, which focuses <coughs> on the soft tissues of the information. And here, the, that's the, just an example, which shows that the, the fusion of these two 
can give us like, can give the, like the physicians better information than having these two together. So there are several applications of image fusion. Satellite reconnaissance, aerial imaging, military operation, web interdiction, robotics, and medical imaging. So the data set that has been used in, the, in this paper is this example, the lower abdomen. The first one is the CT, and the second one is the MRI of the same C. And this is the second set that has been used, CT and MRI too. So the proposed method is first the input image is filtered using a Gabber filter to remove the noise and enhance the texture of the image. And then the, ma the maximum pixel uh, are going to be selected before entering the pulse cable or neural network to enhance the relevant features of the image. And then the fusion is just taking the maximum of these two and then after the fused image, we apply a filter to smooth the image and remove the noise. <coughs> so the GABA filter here is just to enhance the texture of the image, remove the noise, because they have the capability of removing the noise, and they have the capability to enhance the image and enhance the feature in different direction of the image. So the pulse couple neural network is typically divided into three stages. The first one is called the receptive field, and the, se the second one is the linking modulation field, and the third one is the pulse generator. So the signal first is divided into two signals. The, 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 the F, which is the feeding, is just the, the, the pixels based on their arrangement in the image. And the linking is just they enter the network based on the linkage between the pixels. So after that, the linking is multiplied with a constant, and add a, a constant bias is added. So after that, the result U is compared with the dynamic threshold theta. If it's larger than the theta, we will have a pulse. If it's not larger than the theta, which means this neuron is noisy and we don't want that, it will be taken back to the network again. And this is some of the pulse cover neural network equations. So this is the result we got here. So as we know, is the CT and MRI, they complement each other. So by fusing them together, we will be able to get some soft tissues and bone information at the same image. And this is the performance evaluation measure that we use. So we use the entropy, which is a sign of the information, how high the information content in the image. And 9.2 is a high number. So the standard deviation is shows how the contrast in the image, which is 57.3 which is higher than the existing method. And the root mean square, or we want that to be as low as possible, and it's, it's 0 0.02, it's very low. And this is the second <coughs> image. So we, can, we are able to see the soft tissues of, the, of the, the MRI and some of the bone details at the same time. And this is the performance evaluation measures for the second set. So 8.9 for the entropy, 71.6 for the standard deviation, and 0.01 for the root mean square error. So this is a comparison that we did with the control transform, discrete wavelet transform, and shear lit and human feature visibility method. And they are pretty well-known methods in the medical fusion. So the, in the entropy, we got 9.2, which is much higher than these two, these three. And for the standard deviation, is a little bit higher than all of them. And the root mean square is much lower than this, than the other methods. And this is what we want. So our paper presented a technique for a medical image fusion based on GABA filter and pulse cover neural network. <coughs> 
It addressed the problem of texture and information content issue in the image. The use of Gobble filter <coughs> helped us to enhance the texture and remove the noise. And the combination of these two helped us to get a better fused image with high texture and high information content. Thank you very much for listening. I would like to know what the neural network is actually learning to give us some additional comments about that. Uh, you mean about the pulse couple neural? Yeah. So the pulse couple network is capable of enhancing the relevant information in the image. So by using that, we will be able to enhance the relevant features that we want from those images. So it doesn't learn? No. It's so predetermined. So pre <laughs> Okay. It doesn't need to pre-train. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, another question about the uh, root mean square. So what are you comparing? So, so you have we two images. So okay. yeah, for the root mean square, we need the reference to compare with. So we picked from the comparison that we have, we picked the best one between them to compare with our result. Mm -hmm. So this number is compared to the best one of these three. So you already know what you are, your goal is. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. <laughs> Could the next group come up? So our next talk is going to be titled Ring-Based Wearable Bioelectrical Impedance Analyzer for Body Fat Estimation. The authors are Muhammad Usman, Shani Thapa, Adarsh Gupta, and Wei Shu from Rawan University. So uh, I will wait for the speaker to be ready. Wiley is setting up since the program allows 15 minutes between talks. Uh, I set my timer to about 12 or 11 minutes and give the speaker heads up in case so we stay on track. Uh, we started a few minutes late, uh, but we can wrap up the session. I'm from Rowan University. I'm a PhD student at the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Um, today I'm going to present my paper on ring-based variable bioelectrical impedance analyzer for body fat estimation. This project has been conducted in collaboration with Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. They helped us in obtaining the IRB so that this design device can be tested on actual human subjects. Obesity is one of the most serious public health challenges nowadays as it is linked to an increased risk of many chronic diseases such as diabetes and other cardiovascular diseases. Thus, measuring fat mass is necessary in order to study this obesity epidemic, its causes and its consequences. Popular methods such as the body mass index estimation is a very inaccurate method for, calculate, for estimating the composition of the human body. As you can see from the figure, the two subjects with this diff entirely different body composition, if they had the same mass, uh, same weight and the same height, they would have the same BMI. <laughs> this BMI is, a, is an inaccurate method to estimate the body, ma body composition. On the other hand, bioimpedance analysis is a far more accurate method to determine the composition of the human body. So human body is basically made up of <coughs> proteins, water, bones, and fat. All these composition can be found out if we know the impedance of the human body. 
So human body is actually a conductor of electricity and when electricity passes through the human body, it tends to resist it. This resistance to the electrical current by the human body is called bioimpedance. Once we are able to measure the impedance of the human body, we are able to estimate all the components of the composition. So bioimpedance analysis, presented as BIA, is a non-invasive quick method which requires minimal subject collaboration. Commercially, there are many body fat analyzers and body composition analyzers available. For example, the Omron body fat monitor, it costs around $30 on Amazon, and it measures the body fat. <coughs> on the other hand, you have really complex machines used in clinics to determine very accurately different composition of the human body, like body fat, body water, skeletal mass, and muscle mass. So, as you can see, that these devices are either large and bulky or they are very expensive. What we are targeting towards is de uh, designing a device that is wearable, smart, inexpensive, lightweight. So, body impedance is a complex term. It has a resistive component as well as a reactive component. So, the cells of the human body contain fluid. It's called intracellular fluid. And those cells are also swimming in a pool of fluid, which is called extracellular fluid. This fluid imposes the resistive part of the impedance, while the membranes of these cells impose a capacitive resistance, which is called reactance. So when electricity passes through the human body, the higher the frequency of this electricity is, the more cells it tend to penetrate into, because for higher frequencies, the reactance is much lower. <coughs> so, the electrical equivalent of the human body can be represented as this circuit uh, where you have a resistance uh, which represents the extracellular, is the extracellular water and you have in parallel with another resistance which represents intracellular water in series with the capacitive reactance of the cell membrane. So, in bioelectrical impedance analysis, basically a very small and safe amount of electrical current is passed through the human body, typically less than 1 milliamp at a very high frequency of 50 kilohertz so that it can pass through almost all the cells. Um, when the signal is passed through the human body, uh, the known amount of current is passed through the human body, the, the voltage is measured. And by using Ohm's law, this measured voltage divided by the known amount of current and the magnitude of impedance is find out. The next thing after that is to find out the phase difference between the supplied signal and the measured signal. So. Uh, once that is determined, we can find out the impedance of the human body which comes in a Cartesian form with one component as, as resistance and the other as reactance. The design system interfaces with the human body by using a four electrode method. It's far more accurate that, than by using two electrodes since it reduces the skin contact resistance. Once the resistance of the human body is known, there are many methods which can estimate, there are many equations that can estimate the fat mass. We went through a bunch of equations, but the one equation that shows the most correlation, we picked that. So this equation, it takes your height, weight, age, and gender, along with the resistance and reactance component from the impedance, and it calculates the fat-free mass. Since fat is an electrical insulator, the bioimpedance gets everything except fat. So once you get the fat-free mass of the human body, you just subtract it by the weight, and you get the fat mass. So this is the system architecture of the, the device that we have designed. Uh, so initially, we have a sine wave generator, which generates a sinusoidal signal of 50 kilohertz. After that, it's the most important part of the system, which is the hauling current source. Its responsibility is to provide the safe amount of electrical current to the human body. Then the design system interfaces with the human body by using four electrodes. Two electrodes are used to supply the current, and the other two electrodes are used to measure the voltage. The measured voltage is then amplified and filtered, and its amplitude and phase difference between the original signal and the measured signal is detected. Once these two factors are determined, the amplitude and the phase difference, the microcontroller computes the impedance from these uh, components. Once the impedance is computed, it communicates with the nearby cell phone uh, by using a Bluetooth device. We have made a we have made an Android app that allows the user to enter their height, weight, age, and gender. And along with the impedance value calculated from our device, the app calculates the fat mass. The app also has the capability to monitor, uh, monitor the fat mass through a prolonged period of time for a specific subject and to keep record of user information. 
So this is what our design device looked like. So initially, uh, till now we have designed a prototype of a ring-based variable bioelectrical impedance analyzer. The ring has four electrodes attached to it. When, when you wear the ring, the inner two electrodes are in contact with the inner side of your finger, and the outer electrodes are, will be in contact by the other side of their hand, and then the circuit is completed. Uh, the electronic circuitry will calculate, will measure the voltage from your body, and then will calculate the fat mass, and will send it to the smartphone. Uh, this electronic circuitry is then enclosed in a hardware enclosure, which is attached to a strap so that you can wear it on the wrist. The only wires that are leading from the electronic circuitry to the ring are bundled up and sealed. So the most important part of our circuit is the uh, current source, since it's responsible for providing a safe amount of current to the human body. So uh, since the current that uh, you're applying to the human body has to be less than one milliamp, it's a safety issue. So we have chosen 900 microamps. Our design of current source is tested by varying the resistance from 100 ohms up to 6 kilo ohms. And you can see from the result that the design or the design uh, current source is able to provide a constant current up to 3.1 kilo ohms. Since the human body uh, has a resistance of uh, between 200 ohms and 800 ohms, this system will work on almost all the subjects. The design device was compared with the commercially available body fat monitors. So the first graph you can see is uh, a linear correlation plot between the Omron, uh, it's a commercial device for body fat estimation, and our device. So the device was tested for 40 healthy human subjects. Um, an IRB was obtained from Rowan University School of Medicine, and uh, the device was tested for 40 healthy human subjects. Pregnant women and subjects under 18 were not considered in this study. So the results demonstrate that there is a very high correlation between our device and the commercial device, with a correlation coefficient of 0 0.9, which is around 90%. The second graph demonstrates the, the bland augment plot between our device and the Omron commercial body fat monitor. On the x-axis, you have the mean fat mass, and on the y-axis, you have the difference in measurements. 38 out of 40 subjects lie within 95% of the limit of agreement. One more thing that these results demonstrate is that the, for majority of measurements, our device overestimates the result from the commercial one with a mean difference of 1.63% and a standard deviation of 3.41%. This is mainly due to the electrode size difference. Uh, it can be reduced by either increasing the size of the electrode or by using additional circuitry. <coughs> So eventually, we have designed a wearable bioelectrical impedance analyzer for body fat estimation. And this device was validated for 40 healthy human subjects against a commercial analyzer. And it shows a great potential to replace the commercial analyzers for wearable real-time body fat monitoring. What we are working towards now is miniaturizing the whole electronic circuitry so that it can be fit on top of the ring. The ring would also have an LCD attached to it so that you can also monitor your uh, body composition uh, on the ring along with the smartphone. Um, furthermore, what we would like to do is that along with the fat mass, we would like to validate our device for other body composition, such as body water, muscle mass, and skeletal mass estimation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions. <laughs> questions for our speaker? Yeah, well. I mean, what price range are you targeting? Like, how, what was the? Uh, the body fat monitors are around a, a $700 billion industry. Mm. And the device that we have designed till now, it costs less than $20 oh, wow. overall to manufacture. It depends on the marketing point of view, mm -hmm. like how much we want to target right, right. the subject, the, the consumer. Um, so, yes. for your fat mass calculations are those from papers from the past or is that something you guys did and came up with that calculation so if you go back to it um, um the compare the, the equation yeah so converting your resistance to um body fat mass yes there are many equations that are proposed by different authors mm -hmm. which calculates the fat free mass um this equation right mm -hmm. <coughs> There are many equations available that calculate the fat-free mass from uh, 
all the uh, anthropic measurements. Uh, we took five equations and then we tested them all. And the equation that demonstrated the, the most correlation with the commercial device, we selected that one. In future, when our devices, when we have more subjects available, because it requires like hundreds and hundreds of subjects to calculate like a precisely one equation, we are also targeting towards creating our own equation. Um, the other question I had was, why did you guys pick the Omron? Why a commercially available device as compared to something more accurate or more um, used in research papers? like a bioimpedance measurement. Like so, you have those, um, I can't remember the exact name of the scale, but there is one specific type of thing that is used very commonly in research for body fat mass. Um, so basically what we are designing is a ring, uh, it will mostly, mostly calculate the, the upper body impedance. <coughs> so what we wanted to compare it with is that calculates only the upper body impedance. So what we have compared it with is this device, With this device. So what this device does is that you hold it in your hand like this. There are like four electrodes on it, uh, and then it calculates mostly your upper body fat mass, rather than other more com more accurate ones that measure the whole body fat. Okay. But that you also need to put in your weight and height into those because I've used those before. Yes. So does that is that something you should take into consideration for your calculations or anything like that? Because you didn't mention that at all, right? So you just said that you'd be looking at resistance values. But does that get affected by the influx of body fat, of body weight? And <laughs> yes, it does. But like the way you're calculating the body resistance, it also depends. Like for example, mm -hmm. if you have two electrodes which are connected over here, and the other two which are connected over on the foot, then you calculate the whole impedance. And then your body fat like distribution would be definitely different than the only upper section one. So uh, I have a question, uh, and related to this, but not directly, uh, <coughs> the body mass fat. Um, have you um, <coughs> if you know any like paper or publication that use the measure the impedance of a, like tumors? Compared to healthy tissues, you didn't find any different. I'm just thinking about any uh, extend, extended your application of this technology. Yes. So I read a paper in which they were studying. They were basically uh, studying the the variation of body water after a cancer treatment. So when you when you remove the tumor, then initially the the body fluid increases. Initially, it decreases because you're removing something, and after that, the body fluid increases, and after that, it stabilizes. Well, I'm, I'm actually thinking about the local measurement on, on the tumor tissues, like compared with the impedance of the healthy <coughs> tissues. Is there any difference? I, I assume mm -hmm. there should be some difference. Uh, the, the tumorous tissue, it depends if, it's, if it has more value of water or less value of water, it would definitely affect the impedance. Okay. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll stop. You can always talk with the author later. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, as you just mentioned, my talk is on comparing alpha rhythm detection between this novel tripolar concentric ring electrode and conventional disc electrodes uh, that are used in EEG. So I want to start with just a little bit of background on EEG. Uh, first off, it is a measure of brain activity. Uh, it's taking the difference of potential between usually a recording electrode and some reference, which is uh, located on a different part of the scalp or uh, nearby the head. Uh, and what is really measuring are populations of cortical neurons, uh, as well as some muscle activity uh, produced by the scalp. And what this allows us to do is to capture uh, the rhythmic activity that is uh, generated as a result of these large groups of neurons uh, working. Uh, so what you see right here is a typical EEG electrode in lead. Um, it is a single conductive uh, <coughs> piece of metal uh, with a single output lead, and it's usually adhered down to the scalp with some kind of conductive paste. Uh, this design has essentially remained unchanged since EEG has been around the last 100 years or so. Uh, so our collaborators at the University of Rhode Island have worked uh, to try a different method uh, to improve the quality of EEG signals. And that is with these tripolar concentric ring electrodes, or I may just shorten it and say TCREs. And they consist of uh, three main components, an outer ring, a middle ring, and a center disc. Those three pieces of conductive metal are separated by insulating layers. And so the output uh, from each of these electrodes are three separate leads. Now what we're wanting to do in this um, study is to tell how good are these new electrodes to the standard um, EEG that you see on the left. And so one way that we can do that is to just look at the outer ring. Um, there's been several publications out there as well as our own research that has shown the signal acquired from just the outer ring is fairly comparable to that uh, gold cup EEG. So what that allows us to do is um, <coughs> to verify with the same location at the same time how EEG compares to uh, what we're terming TEEG, uh, which is the influence of all three of those uh, conductive layers. Just a little bit more uh, background on these tripolar concentric ring electrodes. Uh, first off, as you guys may know, uh, with TEEG, it has very good temporal resolution, uh, but the spatial resolution is not so good. Uh, this is due to a, a couple different uh, reasons. One of them is the referencing. One way that researchers get around this is by computing what is known as the surface Laplacian, uh, which is the second spatial derivative of these potentials. And the idea behind this is we want to reflect just local uh, activity, uh, local electrical sources uh, beneath the scalp. So how this uh, electrode and electrode system uh, approximates <coughs> this Laplacian is with the equation that you see there. Uh, it's the difference between the middle, and the, the middle ring and the center disk. Uh, subtracted from the outer ring in the center disk. And that, this is what forms that TEG signal uh, that I've been referring to. <coughs> uh, so now I'll move on to the methods of uh, the study. So in this uh, preliminary study, uh, just to benchmark how well this new device works against uh, kind of the industry standard, uh, we recruited seven healthy human subjects, uh, which recorded a total of 10 sessions, meaning several of the subjects repeated. Uh, for all of these tests, the protocol had uh, nine total electrodes, um, including three in the front, three in the center, and three in the occipital region of the scalp. Uh, the reference and ground were on the mastoid, the right and left mastoid, which is the uh, 
the bony protrusion uh, behind your ear. Uh, we sampled at 256 hertz and applied a 0.1 to 100 hertz bandpass filter. And so, as I mentioned in the, the title, uh, we're looking at alpha waves. So these are naturally occurring waves uh, picked up from the EEG at around the 8 to 12 hertz frequency range. Um, and it's been shown for decades um, that these can be strengthened by a subject closing their eyes and then suppressed when the subject opens their eyes. Uh, so therefore, the, the task that these subjects performed was alternating opening and closing their eyes. So 30 seconds eyes open, 30 seconds eyes closed. This was repeated five times. Uh, we used an auditory cue to control that timing. Uh, so now on to the results and discussion. Uh, I'll first start out with a, a kind of zoomed in uh, display of a signal from a representative subject and then kind of zoom out and show uh, more of the collective results. So right here, uh, the, the top plots are related to that TEG signal. The bottom plots are related to the EEG signal, meaning just the outer ring. Um, and the black tracing you see on the left side uh, is the signal um, recorded from one of the occipital channels. Uh, and right away you can see that in the eyes closed period, the signal is very rhythmic, uh, whereas when the subject opens their eyes, more it becomes more wideband. Um, some of the higher frequencies seem to dominate. Uh, and while this shows up for both the TEG and EEG, looking at the power spectrum on the right uh, for the eyes closed tracing, which is in red, and the eyes open tracing, uh, which is in green, uh, you can look at around, say, the 10 hertz frequency range. The difference between uh, the eyes open and eyes closed is much greater in that TEG signal than in the EEG signal. Now taking this same, uh, same recording, same segment, and zooming out a little bit, um, we have here the black tracing is kind of the whole signal over a couple cues, over say two minutes or so. Um, and you can see, and especially in the very top plot of the, the TEG signal, uh, there's a, a very distinct difference in amplitude between the eyes closed and eyes open stage uh, as compared to the EEG signal. Uh, but then looking at the spectrogram, which is a type of uh, time frequency analysis, we see a very strong uh, red band right there around 10 hertz uh, for the TEG. Um, however, it, there is a, a somewhat strong uh, red band for the EEG signal, uh, but certainly not as, as visible as in the TEG signal. So while this was more of a, a qualitative look, our next goal was to quantify this. Um, and we did that using this equation um, for alpha rhythm <coughs> modulation. And it's taking the mean band power in that mu frequent, or the uh, alpha frequency range uh, during the eyes closed period, subtracting it from the eyes open period, and then normalizing it by that eyes closed period. And what these topographic maps show is for all nine electrodes um, is first off, all the electrodes did show positive uh, alpha rhythm modulation, meaning that alpha rhythm did get stronger when the eyes were closed as opposed to when the eyes were open. This is to be expected. Um, but what it also shows is, um, maybe it's not as clear on the projector, uh, the occipital regions uh, near the back of the scalp are far more red, meaning there's much stronger modulation there. And this makes sense because the main difference between your eyes being open, your eyes being closed, uh, is visual input. And visual input is mainly controlled in the posterior regions of the brain. So then our, we concentrated our analyses on these last three channels that, um, in the occipital region. Uh, so this is a box plot. Um, for all sessions, all subjects, uh, comparing the alpha rhythm modulation uh, from the equation of the, on the last slide for TEG, EEG, <coughs> and then the matched paired difference between the two. Uh, and you can see for the majority of uh, subjects and sessions that the uh, alpha rhythm modulation was greater in the TEG. Um, and using a signed rank Wilcoxon test, we did show that there was a significant difference between the TEG and EEG. Uh, for this metric. Uh, so up until this point, we've been comparing TEG to uh, a referential EEG, meaning it's the recording electrode and then that reference on the mastoid uh, that I spoke about earlier. Uh, this is, some, is sometimes done in EEG research, but oftentimes uh, researchers look for other ways to reference 
these electrodes to get a better signal. Uh, so we wanted to compare these other referencing methods to the TEG. Two of the most common are uh, bipolar reference and common average reference. Uh, and for the bipolar, as you can imagine, it's just the difference between an electrode and one adjacent to it, usually uh, within a couple centimeters of it. The common average reference, in contrast, is uh, taking the mean, mean value of all the electrodes at a given point in time and subtracting it from that electrode. Uh, so we perform the same analyses as done before. Uh, and again, these are, uh, these are distributions for all subjects, all sessions in those occipital channels. Uh, and we show really, it's fairly comparable uh, to the TEG. Uh, there was no statistical uh, difference uh, between these for the bipolar <coughs> or the common average reference. Um, but I think it is worth pointing out if these two were considered comparable, the main advantage that this TEG and TCRE uh, electrode system has uh, versus these uh, bipolar and common average reference uh, referencing methods is it's a single electrode. Uh, whereas by definition, the bipolar requires two electrodes and the common average reference requires many electrodes. Um, so I think that's just uh, worth noting. Uh, so on to the conclusion. Some of the key points of, uh, of this study is, first off, we were able to find uh, a difference in the signal when the subject closed and opened their eyes uh, in both the TEG and those referential EEG recordings. Uh, but for eight of the 10 sessions, the TEG was superior in showing uh, those modulations. Uh, however, as I just uh, explained, there's not a significant difference uh, between bipolar or common average reference, um, but with that advantage being this is all contained in a single electrode. Uh, so that led us to the conclusion that these tripolar concentric ring electrodes uh, may better detect changes in the EEG. So where do we go from here? Uh, this is very much a preliminary study, uh, so we'd like to recruit more subjects. Um, but since this has shown uh, promising results for the simple task of eyes open and eyes closed, uh, perhaps it will show uh, better results in other areas of EEG research. <coughs> These include sleep scoring, uh, finding biomarkers for seizure detection in patients with epilepsy, and uh, detecting movement uh, in subjects with neuromuscular disorders. Uh, so in that sense, we would transition this to more clinical populations. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the lab I'm a part of, the Sundrum Lab in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at University of Kentucky, uh, our collaborators at the University of Rhode Island, and uh, NSF Grant uh, for allowing us to conduct this study. Um, so yeah, I'll open it up for questions. <coughs> Uh, for comparison, did you put two electrodes uh, beside and next to each other, or just you used uh, the three ring angular electrodes? Just the, the three ring, but then we used just the outer ring uh, to emulate what a, a conventional EEG would be. Okay. Do you think that that outer ring uh, is very similar to the gold cup electrodes? I mean, conventional. Yes. Did you compare those two? Yes, um, in more informal studies we did before testing, we did compare it and the signals were very similar, as well as uh, over the past <coughs> 10 years or so, uh, the collaborators at Rhode Island have published uh, papers showing that the, the signal is essentially the same. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Um, just for the, uh, the human recognition for the data collection, mm -hmm. um, do we have like any exclusion criteria or something like that for the human subjects? Uh, for this task, uh, no, because um, it's eyes open, eyes closed. <coughs> um, for other work that we do in our lab, including movement, uh, yes, there is some, but uh, this was a, a fairly straightforward. So do you expect like you have like more population? You I'm have sorry? like, do you expect you, you will have more population? Uh, yes. 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 Sure. It's just a, an issue of time, I think. Yeah. Do you know how much the price difference between these two electrodes? Uh, so this device is still in the investigational stage, I don't believe. It's commercially, I don't think you can buy it yet. Um, so yeah, that's something to, to look at. Well, we can stop now. Uh, and quick one to the next stop. Thanks, Chase. <laughs>
why he is setting up. The next talk is also going to be from Jose Kumar from the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Kentucky. The title of the talk is going to be elucidating the mechanisms of 200 kilohertz tumor treating fields with a modified DT here. The authors are going to be Yu Zhao and Guigen Zhang. And they both are from University of Kentucky, and I believe the speaker is going to be uh, So, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'll find us. most knowledge on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so actually I learned about this concept like two months ago in a conference, like uh, a professor from Harvard gave this talk on his work in simulating this effect. Uh, that, of course, that immediately caught my attention, although I'm not fully sold by the content he presents. So then I learned that like, this presentation opportunity here in Google so I just say, why not spend one month and try to do something? So I just present some preliminary results. And it's in like very rough shape. So if you find out any mistakes or like you have questions, just tell me. So just some basic information on this tumor treating fields. So tumor treating fields are <coughs> electric fields that are used to kill cancer cells, but not normal cells, because they target those proteins that are involved in the mitosis process. And there are clinical trials being performed on various types of <coughs> cancers. And pretty interesting is that it has been approved by FDA on brain cancer. And the frequency of this uh, electric field used is within the range of 100 to 300 kilohertz. And the field strength is like one to three balls per centimeter, which is actually very weak. So it's safe. So currently, there are kind of two main proposed mechanisms of the action. The first, why is that? You said this electric field interferes with the assembly of tubing diamonds into this microtubule, and that will result in a normal spindle formation. And that happens in the metaphase. And the second uh, postulation is that it will inhibit the propagation of this lattice formation in the uh, midline of this cleavage barrel by through disrupting the alignment of the septum filament, which is in the atom phase. <coughs> so here are some published experimental results. Uh, the first one is uh, quite simple. It just shows the electric field will actually reduce the proliferation rate of these cells. And if you look at the middle figure, you will see that the optimal frequency is either 100 kilohertz or <coughs> close to 200 kilohertz for different types of cells. So it's a quite narrow range. And if you check the third picture, you will find that uh, the voltage under which like 90% of the cells are killed is usually like in the <coughs> field strength of one volts per centimeter to three volts per centimeter. 
So <coughs> usually, like people would think that electric field and this frequency is useless because, like in this low frequency, electric field cannot penetrate cell membrane. So actually, it has been used to stimulate the neurons. And for high frequency, it will generate a lot of heat according to this E square expression. So it's really used for tumor ablation. So what can this like middle range frequency do? So we we'll try to answer that with uh, computational modeling. So what computational modeling can actually do to help us understand this? So we know experiments can present phenomena, but they cannot elucidate the underlying mechanism. So that's then we can do modeling. So if we do modeling and do it correct, and modeling results validated by experimental measurement, that modeling can be, that model can be a benchmark for quick testing. And this modeling helps us to test hypotheses that are not easily tested by experiments. So where are we now, like from this computational modeling point of view? So people have done this uh, using this molecular dynamics approach to determine the dipole moments of these molecules in cells and they build that into a database. So this is very helpful as to like explain how this field uh, exerts its effect. They did some simple calculation of this dielectric basis force on these molecules uh, based on conventional DV theory. But since I've been working on this DP theory for like, my whole PhD, and so I know like it has many like limitations. So the, this is like a superficial level of calculation. So the threats of conventional modeling has not been exploited at all. So I just briefly touch upon what is uh, DEP. DEP means like a dielectric object <coughs> can move in non-uniform electric field. So if it is like more, the dielectric particle is more polarized than medium, it will move towards the, towards the strong field region and it will move to the weak field region otherwise. So this technique, like it's first being used like in bioengineering field, is used for manipulating like cells, <coughs> like two cells sorting or cell panning. Later, like some works have been down to like go with effect on the interior of cell structure. But not much work has been done to like use this technique to manipulate molecules like inside the cell. So I mean like the most difficult part is like de by developing like a new <coughs> theory or not say new theory, a modified theory and explain all that. But I don't want to like lose audience with those equations, which like that takes like three weeks for my work, and like I only spend like two days for getting this following results. So I just like jump to the results without looking at these equations. So basically, with to save time, we develop this PCM model. You see the square, which is stand for the media domain, and like on the left and right are two boundaries where you can apply like biasing condition or ground condition to create this non-uniform electric field. And we want, but to notice here is like this electric field is like the gradient is actually quite large. In real case, like the change of electric field <coughs> over a cell is actually small. So I did uh, just to show like if I do like close to a uniform electric field, you probably won't notice the magnitude of the force. So we try to investigate the influence on the, of the electric field on these following three uh, molecules, like the tubulin dimers and the microtubules uh, like formed by these uh, tubulin dimers, and finally the septin filaments, which are all like, proposed uh, molecules. So we first look at the influence of electric field on tubulin. And given that the permanent dipole moment uh, of this tubulin has been measured as uh, 2000 Dalton, so we know that electric field will align dipoles 
in in them. So if we assume that this dipole is aligned along the electric field direction, we can calculate the force on the like on the permanent dipole. That's like on the order of ten to the order of negative twenty two. I don't know why this is not uh, shown. So it doesn't matter. If you look at the figure here, uh, you, this is the induced DV force because we know like molecules, it has its permittivity. So it will like form this induced dipole <coughs> in electric field. So we calculate this induced DV force and we find that it's oh, under different conductivity of this molecular unit, because we don't know the exact conductivity of this molecular unit, so we did a prime the sweep, and we find that even it changes, like it's on the order of negative 27, which is like five orders lower. So that means this induced DB force can be negligible, so we only need to consider the DB force on the permanent dipole. But we also know that this thermal movement will counteract the orientation of the molecule, so it may not align around the electric field. So we, like for this normal biological temperature, we are able to calculate that the thermal energy is like 10 to the order of negative 21. And we calculate the average variation in the electric potential energy on this permanent dipole, we find it's negative 25. So what's this, it's like three to four orders of magnitude lower. So that means there's no preferential orientation of this tubing because of the thermal uh, effect. So the DB force on the tubing is negligible due to this lack of preferential orientation. So the movement alignment of this tubing less likely to be affected by the imposed electric field. So in order for this electric field to like, show its effect, the electric potential energy has to be on the same order as the thermal energy. So what about these two plane dimers when they form this long chain, say, with 1,000 units, that's a microtubule, that like, gives you around like same energy variation as the thermal energy. But then you calculate the Brownian relaxation frequency of this chain, it's only like 10 kilohertz, while the frequency of the electric field applied is 200 kilohertz. What does this say? This, say <coughs> this rotation of the chain is too slow. So like this switching of this like, direction of electric field too fast, so that the effect of this imposed electric field is zero down. Finally, we look at the influence of the electric field on setting filament. So uh, the, we consider like, because this set Thin filaments will align in the midline of this uh, cleavage furrow midline. So we consider two septin filaments that align parallel to each other and like with a small distance. And we find that this induced DB force between these two parallel uh, septin filaments uh, will either be attractive force or repelling force depending on their orientation to the electric field. So if this filament align parallel to the electric field, you will see repelling force. So not yet this uh, negative. So it's not reducing, actually the magnitude is increasing. And if they align perpendicular to the electric field, it will be attractive force. And you will see that this like shows uh, chains with different numbers of molecular units. <coughs> if you have more units, you have a much stronger force. And this increase in force magnitude is actually faster than the increase in number of molecule units, which like the amplification. So, <coughs> and also we know that because of the, these molecules have like a high charge molecules, though so they will induce this electric uh, double layer, so that of course is high conductivity. So when we go back to this figure, we see that the uh, at high conductivity, only the repelling force like, will have an uh, obvious effect, but not in the attractive force. So, and this is also confirmed by experiments. So the experiment shows that if the uh, 
electric field is applied pa uh, parallel to the direction of this mito mitosis, then it will have like the most obvious effect. And we also look at the enhanced influence of electric field during the end phase of mitosis process because when this formation of this uh, cleavage furrow, the, it, when it becomes narrow, it will enhance the electric field inside, and that leads to increased uh, force magnitude. Uh, accompanied with that, we like according to the reports by others, we they notice that the cell membrane will rapture and like there will be small membrane blobs form in the anaphase when these two cells divide. So we may also be necessary to determine the force distribution of the cell membrane, which is also exerted by the electric field. And they also notice that this nucleus rotates slowly under the electric field. This is actually quite interesting because we just published a paper explaining why cells would rotate because of the uh, inclusion inside. And this paper actually like supports our result. So this conclusion, we show that, although it's like a preliminary result, we show that this under 200 kilohertz is an electric field. Uh, the influence on tubulin and microtubule is less likely to be the main cause. Instead, the induced interaction between septic filaments plays a vital role in the autosis of cancer cell. So for future work, since uh, when I did this, I don't have enough time, so I did not do a 3D model. So definitely 3D model is necessary to actually accurately quantify the relevant forces. And also because we study all the force magnitude in the static condition, so we need to simulate the dynamic movement and alignment. And finally, we might explore possible treatment so that can be coupled with this tumor tree, you say, introducing those drugs that can bind to these molecules to enhance this. <coughs> okay, that would be it. So, thank you. Questions for you? How is treatment? Is, you said it's FDA approved the treatment, right? Uh, yes. So how did they do this on the patient? They just like apply electrode on your head. Like it's a net. You don't need to open the skull? No, no, no. No, it's no. just it's not invasive. So the electrode field can penetrate through the skull and skin? Yes. To the? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so after you see that, it's a very weak electric field they apply, but it has its effect. So if this is a major treatment uh, method, or it's just a junk like, method to clean up some cancer cells? Like, uh, do the surgeon have to remove the tumor and then you do the treatment, or this treatment probably like, can treat the, the, the whole brain tumor? Uh, obviously, they, they cannot claim that they can like treat it. Uh, they will extend the lifespan, and also like it's only used for like the recurrence case. So yeah, but it has also been coupled with other methods. All right. Thank you. Uh, it's regarding the non-invasive, non-contact, 3D optical imaging of blood flow distributions in animals and humans. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sia Rash, uh, I'm from University of Kentucky, and as they mentioned, my uh, today's talk about is about the 3D optical imaging of blood flow distribution uh, in animals and humans. Uh, why the blood flow imaging is important? Because the 
the imaging of uh, regional uh, blood flow can help us characterizing many diseases associated with tissue ischemia or hypoxia for both uh, diagnostic and monitoring purposes. And the metals usually used for the uh, blood flow imaging are uh, Doppler ultrasound, <coughs> but it's limited to the uh, large vessel and all of those big names, which is uh, very expensive and it cannot use for a continuous uh, monitoring or during the operation room. Uh, what uh, one of my focus in my lab is developing the uh, diffuse correlation spectroscopy, which uses the long coherence uh, near infrared light to measure the blood flow. Uh, we shine the near infrared light, and because of the uh, absorption coefficient of the tissue is low in this uh, uh, wavelength, it can uh, penetrate through the deep tissue. And because of the scattering, we get the back scatter signal, huh? and and this uh, signal have the information of the red blood uh, cell moving. And based on the correlation, what the correlation a function of the light intensity, we can uh, calculate the uh, blood flow in a non-invasive way, and it's, uh, this device is a portable, uh, and we can get the flow up to several centimeter. Uh, in our lab, we develop that in a non-contact uh, way, and we also use the uh, as a tomography. We use uh, two source uh, and uh, 15 detector, and we scan all of the area to get the multiple source, multiple detector, and we use the <coughs> A final element model to uh, reconstruct the 3D blood flow, and in this study we also use the 3D camera to get the geometry, and we assign these two together. And uh, one of my focus uh, in this uh, presentation is uh, uh, predicting that the uh, mastectomy uh, skin flap uh, as uh, mastectomy skin flap necrosis. Uh, in our publication, we demonstrate uh, the lack of uh, blood flow is a uh, good indication of the necrosis, and we uh, was able to uh, predict that, but we need to know the location. That's why we moved to the imaging part. Uh, we learned also from the laser speckle contrast uh, imaging, which uh, we use the speckle contrast, which is by definition is the standard deviation over the mean value. We use the seven by seven pixel. Uh, in this method, they use the wide field illumination to get the blood flow in. They're very a shallow dip, less than one millimeter, but this system is the uh, high spatial, high temporal resolution. It's non-contact, non-invasive, and very fast. And this is the raw image. This is the con reconstructed image in the red cortex. and. Oh, what we did with, uh, in my project, in my lab, uh, it's designed by Dr. Juan de Postec in our lab, is combining the advantage of the uh, DCS with the uh, laser spectral contrast images. Uh, so we use the uh, camera system to get the, uh, as a detector, we have a, a zoom net so we can change the field of view. We have, we use the uh, long pass filter so we uh, remove the, Influence of ambient uh, room light with the, the long, query, long coherence uh, light, and it goes through the Gobo mirror. And this Gobo mirror we use that to scan the whole area. Uh, so when we shine the area in each location, we see the speckle uh, contrast in different locations, and different source detector uh, uh, separation give us the information from the different depth. So uh, what we do is we and get the uh, speckle contrast images, we calculate the speckle con contrast, and for each source detector, we use the bandwidth uh, blood flow in a sensitive range. For the 8 by 8, for example, we use uh, 8 by 8 centimeter square, we use the nine mm uh, 6 millimeter to 19 millimeter, and after that, we use all of this information, and we use the uh, modified near fast, which is the finite element model to uh, reconstruct the tri uh, 3D blood flow. Uh, we validate uh, uh, this method using the uh, uh, liquid solid phantom. We submerge the uh, solid phantom in, in to the liquid phantom. Our system was able to see that, and we also used that uh, uh, tube under 
uh, submerging the, into the liquid phantom and we change the uh, pump speed and we were able to see that. But uh, for going to the real body, we need to also know the geometry. So we learned uh, from the photometric stereo technique and we integrate that in uh, our system. In this uh, technique, they use the uh, four different LEDs. So they give us the four different images from the same camera with different uh, uh, shadowing uh, direction based on the different lighting vector. Based on this, we were able to see the, get the surface geometry. And for testing our system, we usually use a uh, cup occlusion to change the blood flow. So what we did at first, get the surface geometry. Based on surface geometry, we uh, generate the tetrahedral mesh because uh, for reconstructing uh, the blood flow using the final element model, we need to have the tetrahedral mesh. We this image shows uh, uh, all of the source location on the arm, and we, uh, based on this image, we get the source detector location, and we um, we uh, measure the boundary blood flow, and we use a near a near fast program to get the blood uh, flow distribution. Uh, this is the uh, blood flow in different different time in the four realm based on occlusion, this is the baseline, this is the uh, ischemic after the cup occlusion, after and this is the after releasing the cup, it gives us the hypermic uh, release, and this is after going back to normal, and this is the uh, temporal for two different area. And after, uh, make sure the system is safe, and if we can get the data, we move this device for the getting the uh, blood flowing this, uh, during the mastectomy because the area uh, with the low perfusion during the mastectomy uh, uh, can lead to necrosis. We want to predict that area. Uh, hence, uh, for the mastectomy, we use the uh, 80 by 80 millimeter square to get the blood flow. This is our result in different depth. We also uh, use the fluorescence angiography system as a gold standard to compare our device. Uh, this is the dash result, and for that one, uh, it's a commercially available, but it's uh, invasive because they need to inject the uh, endocrine green as a dye, and this device was a spy fly, and this is the handhold, they can move that device to see the uh, flow, and we, get, uh, we saw this uh, similar area with the low blood flow in both system. And this image shows the uh, Another measurement, uh, this time it's uh, uh, after, immediately after mastectomy and reconstruction, they put the implant underneath the tissue, and we see, we see the uh, surface geometry, we see the uh, incision area, and we get the, in this one, uh, they did that uh, ICG angiography first. This is the elite system, it gave us the quantitative images and we, I asked them to mark the area with the low perfusion and after that we uh, scanned the same area and our system was able to see this uh, similar area with the low perfusion and after that we want to, before that we used the camera for the uh, uh, 40 by 40 millimeter square or up to 80 by 80 millimeters square. For the animal study, uh, we uh, moved to the rat. We need to have the uh, smaller uh, field of view. Uh, our zoom lens was able to do that, but we add the iris diaphragm in the light pathway, so there is a uh, laser source. After that, we have a polarizer. After that, we have the uh, lens system, and after that, we add the uh, adjustable uh, diaphragm so we can change the spot size and we were uh, be able to uh, get the blood flow in the red uh, head without uh, uh, move, uh, uh, opening the scalp or removing the skull but the only thing we did we removed the uh, hair on the rat because that can ruin our data and this is the blood flow in the uh, and we uh, test this device using the uh, leggy thing enclosing the CCA or common server artery. We have a, our baseline, we have our left side uh, uh, ligation by tightening the uh, CCA. 
a suture and we have both sides and after releasing that. And these two images show the images in two different uh, depth. As we see, it's in half millimeter and this is a temporal one. Uh, we don't uh, expect to see anything in this scalp or skull, but uh, we see the, during the left ligation, we see the uh, decrease in cerebral blood flow in the left hemisphere. If they do the both sides, we see that in the both side, and after we release that, it's go back to the normal on the right side, in the right hemisphere. And we also, uh, uh, this system was also, we also be able to uh, get that even in the uh, mouse head with the area of the uh, 10 by 10 millimeter square. This uh, source detector separation in this one is uh, 2 to 6 millimeter wide. In the bigger area, we use the 7 to 19 millimeter. For the, this study, we use uh, like the uh, rat one, we use 5 by 5 source, 21 by 21 detector. Uh, then the same protocol applied to that. Uh, uh, and this uh, check the blood flow in different. Uh, Sorry, in my uh, monitor, it's very clear we have the uh, low blood flow in here. We have a low blood flow uh, in global after uh, by side uh, ligation, and we see the uh, uh, low blood flow uh, just on the uh, left hemisphere after releasing the uh, right ligation. This is the temporal version of that during the baseline, uh, left side uh, ligation, both sides, and releasing the right side. And as we expect, uh, we see the uh, good change in cerebral blood flow uh, in the, re in the uh, mouse cortex. Uh, so in this study, uh, we, <coughs> have an, uh, we developed an, a non-contact uh, SCDCT or speckle contrast diffusion correlation tomography system for which is a novel technology for the uh, non-invasive fast and high resolution 3D imaging of blood flow imaging. We use the photometric stereo technique and integrated that into our system so we get the both uh, surface geometry and blood flow using one system and uh, at the advantage of the uh, integrating these two, two systems together is we use one camera, we don't need to have a uh, offline uh, co-registration of these two systems. Uh, and uh, this study demonstrates the feasibility and uh, safety of the uh, system uh, to measure the blood flow in the both small tissue in the animal or the larger tissue in the human breast. And the future of the, this study, uh, uh, based on the our server blood flow in the uh, animal study, we want to apply that to monitor the blood flow change in a, a newborn infant. If they have a problem, we can do the long-term monitoring in a non-invasive manner and non-contact manner. And for the mastectomy, the goal of that program is to uh, find a location with a low blood flow, low perfusion, which can uh, lead to necrosis. We want to uh, give that information to the surgeon so they can uh, alter the excision and prevent the necrosis, and uh, this system also can apply to the other vulnerable tissue like the ulcer bird because it's, uh, we don't need to contact the tissue at all. And I wanted to uh, thank all of my lab members, Dr. Yu, my advisor, and all of the funding agency. Which, uh, this program was impossible without them. And any question? And this is our system during the, in the operation room during the mastectomy. Very nice non contact on invasive system. So, in the interest of time, we'll take one question and then we can I'm always talk with the speaker afterwards. Any, any questions? <laughs> okay, thank you. No.
So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Malak Kasemi from the University of Kentucky. And uh, he's going to talk about this target frequency band of cognition and tempo of music uh, via cardiac synchronous EEG. Okay, my name is Mohammed Jawad. I'm from uh, the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of the Kentucky. And the title of my presentation is ta uh, Target Frequency Band of Cognition and Tempo of Music by Using Cardiac Synchronous EEG. As background information, you, go, you know that music can uh, induce powerful emotion and even can improve the quality of our lives. And even they can induce stress or aggressive and yes, uh, music has an important influence on higher brain functions. Uh, this is uh, interesting because unlike most of other brain stimuli, such as taste and smell, smell music has no known intrinsic uh, I mean, uh, biological value. The music therapy is being used in various disciplines and uh, from neurological diseases to palliative medicine and intensive care. <coughs> And uh, while we are conducting this study, so despite the various of evidence in electrophysiological variation induced by music, uh, it is less known about this change while trying to separate the effect of cognition from acoustic structural uh, aspect of music. Um, and in this study, we are trying to do that. And in this study, also we hypothesized that interaction that occur between autonomous car cardiocerebral. Uh, rhythms uh, cause change in neural uh, oscillation triggered by music. And for this, we are using the cardiac synchronous EEGs. So, <coughs> we recruited 14 uh, subjects, uh, seven men, seven women. Then uh, we played five songs for them fast tempo song, the slow tempo song. And uh, the subject's favorite song is the <coughs> subject, uh, the, the song was chosen by subject that was the most favorite song. And uh, the local phase randomized are fa of fast song. And the local phase randomized are the favorite song. And what is the local phase randomized? So uh, for each song, they use a uh, Fourier transform to transfer the, uh, the song or time series to the frequency domain. In frequency domain, we didn't touch the amplitude. We just uh, uh, randomized the local phase spectra, and then after randomization, we convert it back to the time domain by inverse Fourier transform. And uh, for data, we recorded ECG and six channels of uh, EEG. And an example, uh, it is here, it's shown that the red curves are the cardiac synchronous EEGs, the blue curve is ECG, and uh, the cardiac synchronous EEG just the segment of EG is just synchronous to one portion of cardiac cycles. <coughs> Here we use the pre orbit segment of the uh, EG. Uh, for analysis, we did eigenvalue decomposition of covariance matrix of uh, bandpass filter of synchronized, uh, cardiac synchronized EGs, and we used the uh, uh, this common band, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma, and gamma two bands, which are, I mean, common in the analysis of EEG. As a result, uh, we realized that the alpha band is the most sensitive band to auditory input, and uh, it responses uh, to all the songs. The gamma band was strongly affected by cognition of the music. Um, because, the, for example, the favorite songs cause the highest increase uh, comparing to all other songs uh, in four largest eigenvalues of covariance matrix of uh, right hemisphere. And 10 out of 12 of them was sig uh, statistically significant as well. Uh, and uh, this change for left hemisphere was smaller and just one of 12, one out of 12 of them was statistically significant. And uh, the LPR favorite sign uh, has the admin opposite effects, like the bigger change was on left hemisphere other than right hemisphere. And maybe it's because of the uh, <coughs> responsibility of the right hemisphere in processing of emotion. Uh, sorry, in processing of music. The delta band, uh, there was not significant, uh, any significant change in delta band. The theta band has the smallest change. 
the beta band, uh, the difference of LPR songs uh, with the original version was very small in this beta band. It shows that this band uh, is not uh, showing any reaction to the phase of the songs. And the gamma band, it has mostly the same response like the uh, gamma 2 band and gamma 2 band was the same, the, the response to the songs. Here you can see that the bar plots here, uh, that uh, the, the, lo the left column is the alpha band, and you can see that most of the songs produce and induce um, in statistically significant changes, especially the la two largest eigenvalues. And the right column is gamma band. You can see that favorite songs and LPR favorite songs, this green and orange bars, that in all the ages it has uh, the higher and in most and all of them or almost all of them, they were higher or and statistically significant uh, in uh, most of them. Here you can see that <coughs> this table for other bands that uh, you can see the, um, the bigger change, for example, uh, how, how are the change, for example, in bands, 10%, 6%, 8%, 82% for gamma band. And uh, for favorite songs, the LPR favorite song and a favorite song, which were the uh, familiar songs for the subjects, they induce higher and larger change for uh, these four largest eigenvalues. Also, the slow signs produced uh, the smallest change uh, comparing to all other songs. As conclusion, uh, uh, the effect of cognition of sound was uh, evident in four largest eigenvalues values of gamma band in a record from right hemisphere, and it possibly can be explained by the responsive higher sensitivity of right hemisphere to favorite song, I mean, to process music. Also, the favorite songs cause higher change and larger change <coughs> compared to other songs, so it shows that the subject's favorite songs, uh, the response was not only because of the auditory response, and it was more than just auditory response. Uh, also, the fast tempo songs produce uh, a uh, larger change compared with slow signs, but uh, still this uh, larger change was much lower than the favorite signs. And this is very interesting that you know that the uh, speed of the song or tempo of songs is the, is the uh, strongest feature of the music that can produce uh, physiological change. But uh, still this uh, strongest feature, acoustic feature of the music produce much smaller uh, change compared to cognition of songs. So it shows that the cognition of the music can produce a much stronger change uh, in all, almost all the ages compared to the strongest uh, acoustic feature of the songs. And uh, another result that s supports this interpretation is that the LPR favorite song, which is the local phase randomness of favorite songs, uh, which was familiar for the subjects, also produced uh, a large change after favorite songs. For, for example, so the favorite songs caused the biggest change. The LPR favorite songs was the second largest, uh, and the rest of them was um, smaller. For example, slow songs was 30 percent, uh, 13 percent, and uh, fast song 33. The LPR fast 46. But this change for favorite songs was 81, and for LPR favorite song was 76. So this comparison shows, again, supports this interpretation that cognition of music is very important. And you should consider this, uh, the cognition of familiarity of music when we are, for example, uh, recognizing these effects in, for example, music scrubbing. And thank you to my advisor, Dr. Pat Forden, and my lab mate. Uh, uh, Mrs. Biswal, and thank you for your attention. Yeah. <laughs> questions? So, yeah. yeah, I have two questions. So here you show that the EEG according with the ECG, right? Correct. And there is kind of obvious changing in the EEG. 
like um, like up with the ECG. So, do you think that the changing in EEG is a real changing in the EEG or just an artifact? Yeah, it is the raw EEG. Okay. So this is just for I mean demonstration. This is the non-filtered EEG. So it is the artifact of the ECG. Okay. But for example, for our analysis, we use bandpass filters. So in bandpass filters, it's not the scenario here. Because uh, it's just a raw EEG and you are correct. It's just for uh, purpose of showing. So the changing you, you saw in the, the, the alpha and gamma, it's across all subjects? All yes. All subjects. And then main concept on the front, the frontal region? Uh, because the table shows F3. Uh, yes. We had for uh, frontal. Temporal and parietal. So the matching coming from the frontal region for all subjects in you? Yes. The next presentation is by Mr. Nigel Sare from the University of Kentucky. He's going to discuss. Yes, um, yeah. thank you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> My name is Amir, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, this study of composite polymeric scaffold uh, consisted of using uh, PLG and PBA charge gel muscle here uh, to make scaffolds uh, with controlled pore opening and drug delivery. So uh, what is the problem? The problem is bone defects uh, that can be caused by many means such as injury, infection, disease, tumor resection, and forms of necrosis. Uh, the current treatment for bone repair right now is uh, bone grafting procedures such as autografts and allografts, which is considered as golden standards. Uh, but with that comes disadvantages uh, of uh, complications uh, from harvesting host bone uh, that uh, results in pain and induce infection at the donor site. So in recent years, many, uh, many people have shown more interest to, um, to come up with polymer carriers for treatment of not only bone defects, but any other muscle or you name it defects. Uh, and uh, for the sake of this talk, I'm going to talk to you guys about the two uh, polymer and hydrogel that I use, which are PLG and PBAEs. And uh, the, the advantage of using polymer uh, carriers is that the, the tunability factor. So you could, uh, t you could uh, have uh, different properties tailored to, to the specific uh, uh, needs that you need for the uh, specific uh, damaged tissue. Um, and these uh, polymer carriers can be encapsulated with different drugs and bioactive agents. Again, for the sake of this talk, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, di uh, doxycycline and simvastatin. So di uh, doxycycline is antibody exhibiting antimicrobial activity, and simvastatin is uh, an antioxidant, is angiogenic, anti-inflammatory, and osteogenic to upregulate the BMP2. Uh, so the treatment disadvantages right now with the oral treatment, uh, the first pass, it is susceptible to the first pass metabolism, and with that comes uh, toxicity at high dosage. And with the polymer carrier, the disadvantage right now is the limited drug loaded capacity. So having those in mind, um, we, we wanted to go ahead and uh, fabricate and characterize uh, composite scaffolds that uh, would uh, give us more uh, tunability factors. So what, what is an ideal scaffold? I, an ideal scaffold is, uh, is one that it, it has to have certain must-haves. So it's one that has degradation rate compatible with the EC information. So as the scaffold is degrading away, the missing tissue regenerates. 
it has to have interconnected porosity to allow for cell ingrowth. It has to have mechanical integrity based on the specific tissue uh, properties. Uh, so with that in mind, here is, is an example of a healing of a critical bone defect. So ideally, you want to design implants that biomimic the graded heterogeneous <coughs> physical, structural, and mechanical properties of the damaged tissue. And you want to have that polymer carrier to be encapsulated with bioactive agents uh, and molecules. Uh, once implanted, uh, once implanted, um, those bioactive molecules uh, cause the patient's own cell to migrate, differentiate, and uh, regenerate the missing, missing tissue. So with that in mind, the, the ultimate goal of this study was to uh, come up with spatial temporal functionally graded scaffolds and have them uh, and increase the tunability factor when, as, when it comes to degradation profile or time de dependent development of porosity uh, and uh, mechanical uh, properties, also the drug capability of these scaffolds. So uh, in this study, we had two aims. Uh, aim number one was to come up with this hydrogel, uh, come up with a method to produce these um, hydrogel microspheres of varying size and properties, or of same size but with different properties. And the second aim was to actually come up with the, the method or the device to make these scaffolds. So to, to uh, come to aim number one, uh, we came up with this uh, method to make this uh, reproducible, uh, well at this point we didn't know they're reproducible, but that was the goal, to make this reproducible hydrogen microspheres. And we basically came up with the two simple ideas of using microemulsion, or I, would, I should probably say control microemulsion because we are using the nozzle, and uh, combine that with photopolymerization. So using that, we were able to make hydrogen microspheres of different size, but we wanted to see if they are, these are reproducible. And so we came up uh, with this, uh, using these three parameters of nozzle diameter that the, uh, the macro solution travels through, the viscosity of the macro solution, and the stair plate speed. And we were able to make hydrogen microspheres of varying size and different properties. And the highlight here is we, would, we were able to make hydrogen microspheres of same size using same chemicals, but with different properties as well. So, and, and we use this uh, to uh, characterize the uh, this particle size distribution. We use the, uh, the Shimutsu and we also use image J. Uh, and we were able to make, to uh, produce hydrogen microsphere anywhere from 10 microns to uh, in 700 range microns. So uh, now that we were able to make hydrogen microspheres of uh, reproducible hydrogen, reproducible hydrogen, hydrogen microspheres, we wanted to see the, uh, the properties of these microspheres. We wanted to uh, look at the physical and mechanical properties. So we, we chose different, um, we chose two, three different sets of hydrogen microspheres of same size. And we noticed that, as you can see, looking at the mesh size and the modules, the, the higher the macromer solution viscosity, viscosity goes, the smaller the mesh size and the higher cross-linking density. And so the, the, the hydrogen microsphere becomes more uh, stiff or more, uh, it would result in higher modulus. Um, we look at the swelling ratio of these hydrogen microspheres and uh, uh, we see that you know, as the, the macro solution viscosity decreases, so you would have more spacing between your hydrogen microspheres. Uh, and so you, uh, that results in uh, exhibiting a higher res um, swelling ratio because it, takes, it would take more water. Uh, and lastly, we wanted to look at the effect of hydrogen microsphere size uh, as respect to the, uh, the drug release uh, of uh, simvastatin. And we noticed, again, as expected, the, uh, the smaller the hydrogen microsphere, the higher uh, rapid uh, initial um, drug release, and this is more likely due to the increase of surface to volume ratio. So now that we have these hydrogen microspheres of varying size and properties, we were able to go ahead and make these scaffolds. Uh, so we came up with two, two mold systems, uh, which are basically func uh, functioning through compression and heat. So these, this mold system here, as you can see, 
uh, you could make actually graded scaffold. That means you could have three different layers put on top of each other. And so you could have, like f for applications like going from soft to hard tissue, you could have, uh, you could use the scaffolds. Each layer have its own specific uh, properties. And as you can see, this, this right here, this uh, scaffold, it went through degradation, but as the, the, the top layer uh, is more porous than the bottom layer because it had different hydrogel, uh, chemi chemically different hydrogen um, microspheres or size and, and so on. So this is uh, using, um, that was, this is the, uh, the mold we use for actually graded scaffolds. Moving on, we were able to make this other device that uh, it would allow us to make concentrically or radially graded scaffolds. Uh, so you have two rings and a core. Uh, for applications like uh, if, like the first one that I show you guys, for uh, if you have cortical bone going to cancel this bone, so you want to have different properties, you want to biomimic uh, the, the missing tissue structure and uh, all the other properties. So we have these two, two systems to make our scaffolds. And here I'm just showing you guys the, uh, uh, here's a, a micro CT image and here you have the SEM image of uh, a three layer scaffolds actually graded and then you have just a one layer. And here you see how once it goes through the heat uh, uh, going above the glass transition temperature, how the PLG embed these hydrogen microspheres. So as time goes on, the hydrogen microspheres degrade away and leave that porous structure. And this is advantageous because uh, initially these scaffolds have the mechanical properties to withstand in the, uh, at the site. And as time goes on, uh, they, uh, uh, the, these uh, hydrogen microspheres degrade away and release the drug. So here, just to highlight the, uh, um, the, 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 here to highlight the time dependent process of the development and mass loss and mechanical properties, we use the same exact material uh, for these uh, two scaffolds. So we use, we, uh, we made one actually graded and one uh, concentrically graded scaffolds using three different PLGs and three different PBA hydrogen microspheres. Uh, again, going from hydrophobic to hydrophilic. And as you can see, uh, this highlights the, the two graphs that you see here. It highlights the, the effect of the structural configuration property of these scaffolds. As you see, uh, the actually graded scaffold um, uh, is, showing a, a slower, is showing a slower degradation overall due to limited surface area of the layer. So you have all those layers on top of each other so the medium doesn't get the same access as it does with the concentrically graded scaffold. And that goes with the same with the, uh, the concentric scaffold that uh, exhibit a higher compressive modulus even as porosity is increasing. Because you have that outer core right here that has the same height for the whole scaffold. And, and even though this, the scaffold is getting more porous from within, it still, has, it still holds the mechanical uh, properties that it was intended for. So uh, moving on to this, to this uh, slide, uh, it, it shows the time-dependent development of porosity. So this image here, the cross-section micro CT image here, was taken four days after degradation. And you see just the top layer, the, the porous structure of the top layer. And then the bottom uh, image shows after 10 days. So you have that spatial temporal effect with these scaffolds. So in this case, we had uh, the top layer was, uh, was consisted of hydrogen microspheres of uh, H H6, which was hydrophilic and was uh, loaded with doxycycline, uh, which is an antibiotic. And as you can see, doxycycline was, um, was released therapeutically for two weeks uh, as the simvastatin drug was uh, loaded in the two, uh, two one hydrogen microspheres, as you see in the bottom, and they were released throughout the whole time. So not only we have we were able to hold the mechanical integrity of these scaffolds from the beginning, uh, we were also able to have sequential drug release. Uh, lastly, uh, we we uh, we changed the, uh, the the content of these scaffolds. So. Uh, 
going, uh, depending on which application uh, these scaffolds are going to be used for. Uh, so we, we change it from 41%, 33%, 16% PLG, which means uh, the, the scaffold with the 41% PLG was stiffer. It was, it would probably be used for like uh, bone applications. And uh, as you move to 16, it would probably be used for, for example, muscle applications, we, which we have a, a guy in our lab who does a lot of research on that. Um, so, and, and as you can see, these are, it corresponds to the mechanical properties and as time goes on, uh, the, the, pro, uh, the, the time dependent development of prosody uh, continues. And lastly, this is a, um, another way of making this hydrogel, uh, making this um, uh, functionally graded scaffolds, which was <coughs> through centrifugation and the sedimentation principles. So basically we have, we chose three different sets of uh, hydrogel microspheres, uh, mix them with the, this PLGA uh, mixture that we had, and then going through this process, as you can see, you are able to have hyd uh, hydrogel microspheres of, of bigger size on one side and smaller size on uh, another side. So you could go anywhere from, you could do this in a graded fashion, as I show you through the mold system, or you could do this through a gradient fashion, as you could see with this technique. Uh, and lastly, as, as this scaffold went through degradation, as you can see, this is the cross section, this right here is the cross section of this scaffold after 15 days. And as you can see, there are three <coughs> layers and it's a, it's a gradient change going from smaller size uh, porous to smaller size porous. So in conclusion, we were able to develop a, a, a novel system to, to fabricate these scaffolds, uh, these spatial temporal scaffolds. Um, and uh, we were also able to make this, uh, to, to make this hyd uh, pr reproducible hydrogel microspheres with uh, specific um, properties. <coughs> and also we were able to have a sustained and tunable uh, drug delivery uh, a sequential drug delivery that can be useful in many tissue engineering applications. Uh, at last, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. David Plo, my co-advisor, Dr. Todd Milbrand, and my committee members, Dr. Pat Warden sitting here, and also Dr. Zhu. Have you have you read anything about you know this kind of a composite may eventually lead to different bone <laughs> structure? You know, since you talk about potential application for bone structure, my my suspicion is that uh, you can have this nice you know graded differences in terms of scalpel structure. But when you end up with the bone structure, it may, you know, get the same kind of bone structure. So have you, have you actually read anything, anybody's published work to demonstrate it's possible? What, what part is it exactly possible? You talk about earlier, you, you talk about the potential application of your composite scaffold for bone regeneration. Yes. I'm talking about the bone architect differences in these different scaffolds. Yes. Does anyone show any data? Yes, well, we, we actually conducted an <coughs> animal study well, uh, with Dr. Milbrandt, and he used, uh, what was the name of the drug we used? Uh, I'm not talking about drugs. I know, I'm but I'm just bone. saying because right here I have the exact image right here. Uh, so we use this, this is a PLGA scaffold, uh, consisted of hydrogel, micro, uh, hydrogel particles, not microspheres. As you can see, these are not circles. And we were able to uh, use this for the, uh, the, um, the application he had for missing, missing a, a bone. It wasn't a load-bearing bone, a corneal, but he was able to use it. And this is not just unique to our lab. I mean, this, is, this has been used uh, I mean, the whole concept of using these uh, scaffolds is has been out there for for 
long time, but a lot of people are now focusing in making them more specific. So making them more uh, uh, like to, pro to, to look at the, the biomimic structure of these scaffolds, to have them either graded like a sudden change or have them gradient like continuous change. For example, if you go from like a hard to soft tissue, you have like smooth muscle, you have cartilage, you have bone. So you want to have, if you're missing that, uh, you're missing all those three tissues, you want to have the scaffold that each layer corresponds to the missing tissue, whether it's just structures or uh, boy active agents in it. Yeah, that's exactly my question. Is that a, just the idea at this stage, or no, the, it, anyone has actually demonstrated? Oh, it has been that done. Different microstructure in polymer can actually lead to different microstructure in yes. bone. Yeah, just in our lab, uh, in the past five six years, we've had a, a couple of students who actually implanted these scaffolds for like um, growth factors, uh, not growth factors, a growth plate uh, in uh, rabbits. Uh, and they they got uh, promising results, and that was just in our lab. Okay. So we'll just stop here. Oh, thank you. Okay. where to find you. Last but not least, we have this team from the University of Alabama with Ms. Donahue and Professor Seth. We're going to discuss validation and testing of sorbents for renal replacement therapy following combat injuries. Uh, yes, yeah, so this um, talk is in collaboration with TDA Research out of Colorado. Again, we want to test the validation and test and validate the sorbents for renal replacement therapy. <coughs> Um, TDA Research, they have provided us the different sorbents that we have used to test at UAB. Um, to start, I want to bring up acute kidney injury, which isn't the first thing you think of in reference to combat injury, but statistically, AKI was present in about 50% of wound-related deaths. Um, if available in combat, um, renal replacement therapy greatly reduces the mortality rate by 90%. Um, However, stereotypical RRTs are not um, operable in a combat setting, and even current combat, um, compact RRTs have still a large number of limitations because they are poorly um, suited for long-term field care. Um, and unfortunately, uh, more than 50% of preventable deaths, so the deaths that could have been prevented if RRT had been available, um, could have avoided. Um, by 50%. Um, so traditional RRTs include uh, kidney transplant, peritoneal dialysis, and more commonly like hemodialysis, where a uh, few ounces of blood at a time go through a specialized filter and remove excess waste and solutes and uh, fluid from the blood. Uh, more compact and simpler hemodialysis machines are increasingly popular, but even with better procedures and equipment, um, the, it's a very inconvenient and complicated therapy with many limitations. Um, specifically, they require specially trained personnel. Uh, they require specialized equipment that weighs approximately 70 pounds. Um, and they require large volumes of stereodialysis solutions. So as an example, to treat eight to 10 patients for, 10 day, uh, for four days, um, it would require just over 3,000 liters of fluid, which translates into 7,500 pounds of fluid. Um, so def there de definitely exists an opportunity to improve upon these technologies in the realm for soldiers with limited resources. Um, so these particular sorbents that TDA provided us um, were, are used to treat hyperkalemia, um, which is an excess of serum potassium. Uh, potassium is an essential electrolyte 
within the human body for the, um, particularly like the nerve and the muscles, including the heart that function properly. Um, potassium is the main ion in the intracellular fluid with sodium main ion in extracellular fluid. And the normal rating for potassium in the serum is 3.5 to 5.4 milliequivalents per liter. So anything about 5.4 is hyperkalemic. Um, so when you have traumatic combat injuries, uh, this readily raises the potassium because the dead cells will release that potassium from the ICF to the ECF, raising the serum um, <coughs> ICF um, or ECF um, plasma concentration to very dangerous levels. Um, from TDA, we were obtained eight different formulations of the sorbents that will only remove potassium um, ions from the blood. We were very highly selective on exchange process. Um, currently, this work is proprietary, so I can't go into much detail of the formulations of the sorbents, but the basic mechanism is that sequesters, so it can, um, does excess potassium that so it doesn't build up in the dialysis solution and in the blood so that you can reuse the solution which minimizes the amount of fluid required for renal replacement therapy. So again, if we went back to that example, you would need like 7,500 pounds of fluid. You would need significantly less in the field combat. Uh, with the sorbents, we wanted to term um, these few things um, initially, and these are very preliminary studies that we have done so far, but uh, we wanted to term the acute and long-term removal of potassium, whether, whether if autoclaving resulted in a compromising of the ability to remove <coughs> potassium or in the impact of other salts and biomolecules found in serum. If the uh, sorbent demonstrated any cellular biotoxicity. And lastly, we, we wanted to use our tissue chip models integrated in a microphysiological system, which I'll go in more detail. Um, so TDA did some initial experiments and prioritized those eight sorbents into two, um, and that's Z4 and Z1. Um, and so they selected those for initial evaluation. So for this first experiment, uh, we induced serum with uh, varying concentrations of potassium for a normal serum level, um, hyperkalemic and se severely hyperkalemic and conducted comprehensive metabolic channels to look at all the ions and um, things you typically see in a clinical setting. But I just um, showed the potassium <coughs> results up here. But from this, we could gather that the control serum was about 5.7 milliequivalents per liter. So that is slightly ab um, above normal, but for our sake, it's normal. Um, and the serum samples with the excess potassium actually demonstrated the potassium um, concentration seen in patients with hyperkalemia. Um, with addition of sorbents, the reduction of potassium was only seen in Z4 and not in Z1. And auto, lastly, autoclaving did not have a significant impact on um, the other um, ions and metabolites. Um, so this enabled us to proceed with sorbent Z4 out of the eight um, for future studies. Specifically, we, next we wanted to look at the evaluation and time dependent of potassium um, with absorption of Z4. So we used a ion, select, ion selective I, uh, electrode for potassium um, to evaluate this time dependent removal. Um, using the very varying concentrations of Z4, the amount of potassium removed directly corresponded to the amount of um, sorbent available for a given period of time. Um, initially had a rapid removal of potassium follow a slower rate of removal until reaching saturation. Um, the maximum amount of sorbent, excuse me, the amount, uh, maximum amount of potassium that can be removed by one gram of sorbent is um, from media was about 68% with 20% removed in the first five minutes and 29% <coughs> removed in the first 30 minutes. So. However, the main takeaway from this experiment is how we can use this in the future to tailor um, the efficiency of the sorbent in a very timely manner. Uh, this next experiment looked at the acute toxicity. Um, we used human microvascular endothelial cells um, and for all dif eight different um, sorbents um, and see if they cause acute toxicity. Um, these type of cells would be the first to come in contact. Um, with the sorbents, so that's why we used them. And we did a live dead 
uh, staining with calcium AM and ethidium homodimer 1. So it's a, the calcium AM is the green, um, ETHHO1 is um, the red. And from this, we could gather that all eight sor sorbents didn't cause acute toxicity um, after a one hour time period. But now I will like shift gears for a second to give a little broader understanding of our current and future work. Um, so a large field of study in our lab is using engineering approaches at the na nano micro scale um, to develop new and enabling technologies to address a different host of problems in biology and medicine. Um, so typically the experience that we would have to run to validate these sorbents would be through the use of animal models. And our lab isn't trying to replace animal models, but it's trying to use as a parallel because we're using human tissue and that mimics the physiological environment. And it's a dynamic system, it's not a static system. Uh, so our lab specifically is using tissue chips and microphysiological system, MPS, which can be used for a wide variety <coughs> of applications. Um, so for us, an example, um, our lab, lab has already generated models for the heart, uh, blood vessels, parathyroid, so everything that is outlined in black. And um, this figure on the right is a schematic of what an MSC would typically look, or what our MSC would look like. And everything that is outlined in green is what we're currently working on. So the lung, uh, liver, and the kidney. Um, these in vitro 3D organ systems are from human cells on bioengineered platforms, <coughs> and they use and they mimic the in vivo tissue architecture and physiological conditions. So, um, in this video, you can see the um, IPS cells um, derive my cardiomyocytes under loading conditions. Um, the bottom left picture, you can see the endothelial model with various waveforms with and without, without a SE bed. And then in this um, middle picture, you can see the parathyroid. Um, we have an engineered parathyroid versus a, a donor sample. So you can see the wide variety of like uh, uh, MPS opportunities. Um, but one that is particular interest to me is uh, using these systems for drug screening and within the scope of this project. Uh, so specifically, uh, as we briefly mentioned, um, our MPS, the premise of our ongoing work in respect to the sorbents is um, the kidney model, which I've been working on more, um, a lot lately. And um, to specifically, I want to engineer the proximal tubule of the kidney, where the majority of the reabsorption occurs and the nephrotoxicity occurs. Um, so we demonstrated our preliminary works um, with using renal proximal tubule epithelial cells and human mac microvascular um, epithelial cells. Um, as you can see in this figure, we have our perfusion and our membrane. Um, that right now is a polycomer, but we're working on an ECM-derived uh, membrane as well. Um, so as a conclusion, um, in summary, we evaluated potential TD sorbents uh, that act as a renal replacement therapy for combat casualties. Our results show that Z4 sorbent is effective in rapid potassium removal. <coughs> in terms of biotoxicity, we showed that none of the formulations have acute toxicity, and we're in process of developing um, MPS systems for long-term biotoxicity studies. Um, and overall, this demonstrates the feasibility of using biomaterials um, in developing artificial physiological support following injury to help recover temporarily after obtaining medical treatment. Um, lastly, I want to acknowledge um, uh, Dr. Seth Du, my mentor, um, our, our lab, Dr. Rogers, Dr. Sun, Tom Hagland, uh, TD Research, Dr. Paul, and Dr. Chris, uh, my T32 mentor, Dr. Jennifer Pollock, and Necrology uh, Department of Defense Award to uh, TDA Research and UAB, and um, again, my T32 fellowship from the NIH, the NIDBK. Question. Any questions? Yes. From a FDA standpoint of view, is this a drug or device? Um, so TD is actually developing um, the device for this 
but this bridge dialysis system they have written a proposal on it's in, it's pending currently in so in terms of yeah in terms of approval eventually getting Correct. approval what so this would it necessarily be a drug approved by the FDA but it'd be it'd be um, incorporated within their bridge dialysis system that they are um, proposing right now um, but the idea is that the MPS systems could be um, used to uh, screen drugs in the future. So um, right now we're doing it with uh, drugs that are currently on the market and trying to compare our results, results with those in the literature to prove that our, model, model, uh, our model's validated. So. Thank you. Thank you. So this concludes this session. I believe that uh, lunch will be served shortly. Same place, so outside? Outside. <laughs>